So our second featured reader of the evening will be uh, Dr. Vanessa Grubbs. Uh, Vanessa, a self-described country girl and the first doctor in her family, is an associate professor in the Division of Nephrology at the University of California, San Francisco. She maintains a clinical practice and research program based at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, but narrative writing is her true passion. She teaches writing for patient advocacy to medical students and practicing physicians. I want to hear more about that. That sounds really cool. Um, her first book, Hundreds of Interlaced Fingers, A Kidney Doctor's Search for the Perfect Match, was released in June 17 from HarperCollins. And we do have copies available on our book table tonight. Um, Dr. Grubbs attended the inaugural Belize Writers Conference. You should ask Jean and Vanessa, and maybe there's some other people here about that. Um, it's an interesting new program that's happening for writers. Um, Vanessa lives in Oakland, California with her husband and two cute rescue dogs that help ease the empty nest pangs her teenage son left when he went off to college. And you know, I can relate to that very much. So welcome, Vanessa. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I have to say, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the motivation for this book. Uh, I, when I was a primary care doctor and getting a divorce, I met my husband, who was on dialysis. And through that experience, I decided to give him one of my kidneys. And um, from there, I went on to become a kidney doctor. So. Um, but uh, because I wasn't thinking about becoming a kidney doctor, I was actually quite surprised at what I found when I went into the specialty. It's amazing what you don't um, see when, uh, from the outside. And honestly, I was just disturbed in so many ways about um, how much we uh, kind of use dialysis because it's there and not really being very thoughtful about it. So that was the reason why I wanted to write the book. But when I um, got a literary agent, she told me, you know, Vanessa, um, nobody wants to buy a book about death, dying, and dialysis. So um, you really have to put your personal story in it. So at that point, the book became a part memoir and has at least 85% of my personal business in it. But that's OK. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm going to read for you. Uh, a couple of um, sections from the book. The first section um, is from chapter six of the book called Complications. I looked to my right and saw Robert in the surgical recovery bay next to mine. He was smiling at me, finally believing a transplant was happening for him. I smiled back. I thought of the others who had been considering the same path and had maybe even spoken their intentions out loud but then retreated long before reaching that point of no return. I wondered why retreating hadn't even occurred to me. Was I that blinded by love? Was I that naive? Was I trying to earn my own forgiveness for past mistakes? Yes, definitely, maybe. But in that moment, I felt thankful that retreating hadn't occurred to me, that I had been so bold regardless of the reasons why. My eyes left his to look for the bag collecting urine from his Foley catheter. I found it hanging by a plastic hook at the foot of the bed. Pale yellow urine, and a lot of it, was there. The kidney was working beautifully. I smiled bigger, with teeth showing, and brought my eyes back to his. He saw the happy in my face and matched my smile. We reached for each other, though we were too far apart to touch fingertips. But it didn't matter, because in a way, we were already touching. We were tethered, connected through our new state of sharing two healthy kidneys between us, replacing his old tether to the dialysis machine. We settled for a fingertip wave. I feel like the fatigue has just lifted off me, Robert said, amazed. He didn't realize how tired he had been. He thought it would be several days before he'd notice a difference. I smiled bigger even though I felt all of his fatigue had been dropped onto me. This was new to me, 
the most my healthy body had endured before this day was a C-section to bring Avery into the world. Robert, on the other hand, had endured kidney failure and all that came with it. Having a dialysis catheter inserted, the catheter becoming infected, sepsis, the infection spreading into his bloodstream, the catheter being removed, a new catheter put in, a surgery to create his fistula, another surgery to revise his fistula when it wasn't working properly, nausea, vomiting, leg, back, jaw, hand, everywhere cramping, dialysis Monday, dialysis Wednesday, dialysis Friday for almost six years. But now he had a healthy kidney. So that was 13 years ago this past um, April. And we got married four months after that. People thought I was crazy. <laughs> so this next section I uh, want to read um, for you is, um, I feel like we've been really fortunate, uh, knock on wood, country girl and me, uh, in that we've not had any rejection scares. So. Um, one of the worst things that had happened by the time I wrote this book um, was that he had to have a surgery taking out his parathyroid gland, which is behind the thyroid gland, which most of us are familiar with. And that was a direct complication for having kidney failure. So this um, brief section is after um, he had been discharged from the hospital. Where are you going, I asked, watching him grimace as he began to pull himself up from the couch at home. I'm going to get something to drink, he grunted. You know, I can do that for you. Sit back, I said as I rose and headed to the kitchen. Oh, he said, his face scrunching, either because of pain or because it hadn't occurred to him that I wanted to take care of him. But he did sit back. It was hard for Robert to let me dote on him. He wasn't used to people doing anything for him, and he had learned early in life not to expect it. You're a self-starter, his parents had said to him when he was a boy. Your brother needs extra help, they would say, as they proceeded to rescue his two years older brother, Eddie, from predicament after predicament. Little Robbie was expected to fend for himself. Eddie was presented a new car when he turned 16. Robert bought his first car on his own after college. Eddie's four years at community college, then five more at Morehouse, were parent financed. Robert took loans to cover what his football scholarship would not. As a result, he prided himself on not needing anyone, on not being indebted to anyone. A failing body took away that pride. Every knee that kidney failure created put another crack in the mirror of how he saw himself. The reflection had become so distorted, it was hard to remember what he once looked like, who he used to be. He had needed to live with his parents in order to feel safe. He had needed a dialysis technician to stick his fistula just right in order to have just an okay day. He needed dialysis or a kidney transplant in order to live. Some needs were easier to, easier to accept. Parents are expected to help their children. Dialysis technicians are paid to do a job, but nobody has to give away her kidney. It is a gift that cannot be matched, which was why Robert would have preferred a deceased donor kidney. A dead man collects no debts. My kidney made Robert whole again, gave him hope that he would get back to who he once was and on to the person he believed he was supposed to be. But shards of mirror fell to the floor. Robert felt indebted. And every April 14 since 2005 was a reminder of it. So this, okay, thank you. <laughs> so this last section that I want to read for you is actually um, the motivation for me um, wanting to write the book and for the, the type of research that I do now. So I warn you, it's a little heavy. So this is uh, from uh, what is this? chapter 18, next to the last chapter. 
Uh, so I think it's kind of interesting that I wanted to write a whole book um, about this topic, and it was relegated to kind of one chapter. But um, uh, whatever brings people to it. So chapter 18, Three Ladies. Not long after I joined the faculty at San Francisco General Hospital, I met 83-year-old Ming Li in the pre-dialysis clinic, where I served as the attending nephrologist when my colleague was unavailable. Just a few months prior, my colleague was one of, the, uh, one of my attendings and had been a good three decades and had a good three decades of nephrology experience over me. So I tended to not change the care plans already underway for patients returning to the clinic. Mrs. Lee's plump face was constantly smiling. Okay, thank you, doctor. These were the only English words usually strung together I ever heard her say. A Cantonese interpreter translated the rest and her granddaughter sat silently beside her. Mrs. Lee had an EGFR, estimated glomerular filtration rate, of 16 milliliters per minute, only about teaspoons of blood coursing through her kidneys filters each minute, when normal for her age is closer to 17 teaspoons. She also had an extensive list of other medical problems, blockage in her heart arteries, many strokes, gout, and a recent bowel obstruction, just to name a few. She was scheduled to see a vascular surgeon the following week to talk about creating a fistula for hemodialysis, but she was ambivalent about going to that appointment and about dialysis in general. I was ambivalent too. The plan for Mrs. Lee felt wrong. Given her age and overall health status, I didn't think dialysis was the right thing to do. Though I wasn't aware of it at the time, a small but growing body of research supported my intuition. It showed that patients similar to Mrs. Lee, over 75 and with serious medical problems in addition to advanced kidney disease, were as likely to live as long without dialysis as with it, and often with a better quality of life. This research comes mostly from the United Kingdom, where about 15% of elderly patients with end-stage kidney disease die without ever starting dialysis. They have programs in place to provide conservative management, treatment aimed at minimizing symptoms of kidney failure while ma maximizing the quality of life remaining without dialysis. The United States doesn't track patients who don't start dialysis, but almost all elderly patients uh, who start dialysis do in-center hemodialysis, and patients over age 75 are the fastest growing group starting dialysis. Their numbers have doubled over the last two decades. The burdens of hemodialysis, symptoms of extreme tiredness, cramping and dizziness, dialysis access related procedures and travel to and from the dialysis center are among are common among all patients but particularly so among elderly patients i just want to say at the time of writing elderly was the um, preferred um, word to describe older people now is older because um, elderly is considered pejorative but um, <laughs> Um, I understand most recently there's a new movement to claim old, just like we reclaim the words um, black and queer, you know, just, just to celebrate the goodness of getting older. Anyway, going on. Um, a 2009 study published in the New England Journal of Medicine showed that almost two-thirds of elderly nursing home patients were in worse shape, either less able to take care of their own basic needs or dead within just three months of starting dialysis, suggesting that treating such patients with dialysis was in direct violation of one of medicine's guiding principles, primum non necessary, first do no harm. Like most nephrologists, just completing training, I felt well prepared to diagnose acid-based disorders and do a kidney biopsy, but completely unprepared in how to talk to, uh, talk about or practice conservative management. Rather, I was taught that transplant is better than dialysis and that dialysis is better than death, always. It was as if dying of kidney failure wasn't allowed as if the fact that dialysis existed was, and was readily available automatically meant people should never die from kidney failure, 
we approached dying of kidney failure as a never event, a tragedy, akin to dying of colon cancer because a colonoscopy wasn't done, or of cervical cancer because of missed pap smears. She died of kidney failure? How could that be? We have dialysis. But would it really be such a tragedy if Mrs. Lee did die from kidney failure? Most people say they want to die in their sleep, presumably from a heart that simply stops beating. Maybe dying of kidney failure after you've lived a long life is a close second to dying painlessly in one sleep. I hadn't witnessed it at the time, but I've since learned that the person becomes progressively sleepier and sleepier over weeks, months, even years, so slowly that they may not be fully aware that they are sleeping more. Some have nausea and shortness of breath. Some have muscle cramping pain, but nothing that couldn't be tempered with a little shot of this or that until they just didn't wake up anymore. As a fellow in the pre-dialysis clinic, what I observed for how to have discussions with patients approaching end-stage kidney disease seemed consistent with the monolithic, unquestioning agenda implied by the clinic name. The response to patient hesitation towards dialysis or outright refusal of it often felt threatening, coercive, even bullying to me. Start dialysis or you'll be dead in two weeks. You have a responsibility to your grandchildren to be here. If you refuse to start dialysis, then you will be discharged from this clinic. These were the refrains left in my mind. I was determined not to repeat them. I was no longer the fellow just doing what I was told to do, saying what I was told to say. My actions were my own. My words were my own. I tried something different with Mrs. Lee that day. Not everybody chooses to start dialysis, I said delicately, tiptoeing into a conversation about the possibility of another course. But before the interpreter could say my words in Cantonese, I watched the granddaughter shift in her seat and the cross of her arms tighten. Though she hadn't spoken a word, it was clear that she understood English and that she didn't like what I was saying. I didn't know how to move Mrs. Lee off the path she was on without making her or her family feel that I was denying her care or sentencing her to, a, to death. I didn't know what a different path would bring. I retreated. Well, maybe you should just go to the appointment and hear what the surgeon has to say, and then decide if you want to go for it with it, I said. With these words, the granddaughter's posture softened, and Mrs. Lee smiled and nodded. OK, thank you, doctor. Five months and two surgeries later, I saw Mrs. Lee in clinic again. She had a fistula buzzing in her left upper arm, and I said nothing to suggest she consider a path that did not involve dialysis. Another year had passed when I learned that her kidneys had failed to the point that my colleague thought starting dialysis was appropriate. Her fistula was ready to use. She started dialysis with a Cantonese-speaking nephrologist in a Chinatown dialysis unit. Oh good, I thought when I heard the news. She would be with people who spoke her language, a community who understood her experience. A few months later, I walked into our Reno Center administrative office. I checked my mailbox. I signed off new orders for a new patient's peritoneal dialysis supplies. I chatted with office staff, like any other day. Do you remember the patient Ming Li? asked Bao, the office administrator. Chinese American Bao was a dialysis, dialysis technician before joining the business office. She sometimes worked as a dialysis technician at, a local, dialysis, at local dialysis units, both to help out and to keep her skills sharp. Yes, of course, how's she doing, I asked brightly. She jumped off the roof of her five-story apartment building. She jumped off the roof. The words hit me in the chest so hard they took my breath away. I imagined how unheard she must have felt, even in Cantonese, how dark her world must have been with no sign that sun would shine ever again. Maybe she jumped off that roof because of something completely unrelated to dialysis, but maybe it was all about dialysis and she saw no other way out. And I didn't have the training, the words, the courage to show her there was. I tried not to cry. Thank you.
you so much. Thank you again, Vanessa, for that.